The Permian-Triassic extinction was the most devastating in Earth's history. Up to 95% of life in the oceans died out, and potentially as much as 80% of life on land died out. And it wasn't just a single immediate event right at the end of the Permian leading into the Triassic that caused this extinction. Instead, it was caused over thousands of years by the Siberian Trap Volcanoes, a series of massive volcanoes that release a lot of lava, but also a lot of gases into the atmosphere, causing runaway global warming. Because of this, the extinction still carried out into the early Triassic, meaning the organisms that did live during that time had to deal with this dry, arid environment that the volcanoes had brought about. And that's really well shown in some parts of South Africa, specifically in the Karoo Basin. I talk about the geology of the Karoo Basin more in my video on Mozcops, and this would have been in younger rocks than Mozcops was found in, but the same kind of concept applies for the overall system of how this environment would have worked, except again, now it would have been even drier. In fact, it was so dry in this part of the Karoo Basin during the early Triassic that most life was actually already gone, and in fact, one organism can make up as much as 95% of vertebrate assemblages in this part of the Karoo Basin that animal being Lystrosaurus. And there's been some really interestingly preserved ones, and that's what this paper dives into. How did some of these Lystrosauruses actually get fossilized? Now, despite making up potentially 90% of some of these assemblages, not everything was well and dandy for Lystrosaurus. And that's because we do have fossils of them, and in order to get a fossil of it, it has to die. And there were some of these that were actually preserved with parts of skin still preserved. And that's really interesting to understand how this skin actually got fossilized. And so researchers took a look at one collection and assemblage within a specific part of the Karoo Basin. And the researchers were able to come up with a couple different ideas based on what they found. And first what they found is A, that mummified one, but also other pieces of evidence that some of these other fossils may have also been mummified. The first piece of evidence of this is within an assemblage where a bunch of the bones are all jumbled up, there's one set of a few ribs that are all linked together still. They're articulated the way the animal would have had them in life. And the researchers suggest that, yeah, it probably was attached to the skin and got washed down into this assemblage with all of the other bones, and then that skin rotted away, but still left those rib bones in the same place they would have been in life. And so what does this mean for the mummified one that's kind of splayed out almost like roadkill. It means that probably a similar thing happened, only there wasn't enough time between its death and when it got buried by different sediments for it to actually decay and break apart into those individual pieces, like that section of ribs that got washed downstream. And as for its splayed flat posture, it's not the only one that was found like this. The other ones didn't really have skin, but there were a number of other specimens nearby that were similarly splayed out flat, and so it's pretty likely that these animals all died around the same time, especially since they're in pretty much the same layer of rock. Because of this large death assemblage of different animals all having these same kind of postures, the authors do make some assumptions about what likely happened, and it's likely that these animals were all around a dried up watering hole. And that makes a lot of sense because in order to get buried, you have to be in a low laying area. And you know, watering holes show up in low areas. So if they were all in this, they would have died and then later been covered up by other sediments. In order to understand though, how this whole assemblage came to be, the researchers actually looked at modern day ecosystems experiencing drought, where in places like Africa, for example, young elephants are more likely to succumb to starvation rather than water loss. And actually looking at the bones of these different specimens of Lystrosaurus, the researchers were able to show based on the woven fabric in the bones that these organisms were pretty young. They weren't fully grown Lystrosaurus. So it's pretty likely that the drought led to the starvation of these organisms. And then later, because they were in a low laying area around this watering hole, they could get buried. And it really seems like there were two main methods of burial for these organisms. The first mechanism would have been rainfall and stream motion carrying the bones into the large jumbled up assemblage. And obviously this would have happened after these animals died, which is really unfortunate for them, but it's great for us because that means we can get that preserved. However, the ones that were splayed out don't show that same kind of transport by water. So what likely happened with them is they would have been also in that same kind of basin around a watering hole, but rather than being pushed around by water, it seems much more likely that these ones were actually covered by wind-blown sand and mud. And that makes sense because again, if you have a basin like that, you can collect more sand and mud inside of it. And so it's likely that that's why we have these different modes of preservation. 
and there's a few other ones depending on the specimen that the authors get more specific into. For example, some parts of the mandible aren't really the most likely things to get carried by water, so it's pretty likely when we find isolated mandibles that that's pretty much where the organism died, it wasn't transported very far from where it died. Meanwhile, there are other bones, like some of the vertebra, that are a lot lighter than things like the mandible, meaning that those could travel a lot further, and we can assume when there's a lot of those all jumbled together that, yeah, there was some sort of stream system that actually did push those. They go into a lot of detail about the different finds that they do have here, and what the different isolated fragments could mean. Hopefully we hear more about some of this research in the future, because this paper really only looks at the mechanisms of how it was preserved, not necessarily what even things like the skin would have looked like in life. And understanding that Lystrosaurus is on the line to mammals, but not a mammal, is really important for understanding how mammals may have actually evolved. Additionally, I think when we are understanding that these animals died of drought, we really need to look at what's happening around the world right now, with massive heat waves in Europe and parts of China that are causing many rivers to dry up and actually start meandering in the same kind of way that we do see around the Permian Triassic extinction based on the rocks there, where even within their formerly wide riverbed, you start to get them to split up and meander in and amongst themselves. It's something that's really important for us to make sure we're managing in the face of modern day climate change.